Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues. A few weeks ago, we discussed the importance of encouraging the participation of girls and women in the science and technology industries, considering both the challenges and solutions with the regional players that had convened in Khaborone to commemorate the International Girls in ICT Day. The importance of exposing girls to role models and various career options in these industries was touted as a solution by many of the stakeholders we spoke to at that time. And tonight we put our learnings into practice. It is only right that young girls know icons such as Professor Wangari Mathai, whose name is synonymous with Africa Environment Day. She is best known for being the first African woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for her contribution to sustainable development, democracy and peace. She was also, however, the first woman in East and Central Africa to earn a doctorate degree, one in biological sciences, in 1964. Her most celebrated feat, however, was the establishment of the Green Belt Movement, through which she assisted women in the planting of more than 20 million trees, showing us all the power of empowering individuals and the rural community, the first to be affected by environmental degradation. I think that it is very, very important to continue encouraging our governments and ourselves that the environment is not really an issue for tomorrow. The environment is every day issue. It's the air we breathe, it's the water we drink, it's the food we eat, and we can't live without these things. For me, the biggest challenge is governance because the people at the top have power. Because they have power, they, can, they, they have control of resources, they have a lot of privileges, and they can continue to increase these privileges uh, from where they sit. And the public at the grassroots can continue to suffer. I could see that the top is very heavy and changing the top is very, very difficult. And changing the top if you don't have the grassroots is almost impossible. What we did in the Green Belt Movement was to go to those grassroots, those bottom and instead of trickling down, go to them and say, maybe there is, should be a trickle up. The entry point is the tree. A tree has a personality. And as it grows and it changes the landscape, it also change, seems to change the minds of the people. And it, it brings with it a certain rapport that actually encourages people to do more. So that you start with a few farmers, and before you know, so many other farmers want to also participate. I have always seen poverty as having two sides to it. Poverty will cause environmental degradation because as I sometimes do, a poor person will cut their last tree to cook what may be their last meal. They're not worried about tomorrow. They're worried about today. On the other hand, it is very important for poor people to understand that the more you add a de add a, the more you degrade your environment, the more you uh, mismanage your environment, the more you are likely to uh, dig yourself deeper into poverty. Because we were dealing with the poor people, we also wanted to give them an income, but we were keen not to be seen as coming with a bowl of money to give, a bag of money to give away. So we said, you plant the tree. If you make it survive, we will give you a token of appreciation. And I emphasize that because you, don't pay, you can't pay for all that work. We didn't have that kind of money. They can actually make enough money that, which they can invest and we encourage them to invest in income generating activities so because in many ways you are trying to improve the quality of life to work with the communities you need passion you need to really want to do that 
because otherwise they can be a nuisance and you can be in a hurry because you want them to change like yesterday. Quite often we get people who are educated, they have big ideas, but they want these people to change overnight. They can't. And if you push them too much, they will do it while you are there. And once you pull back, they collapse. So it's always good to hear that there is somebody somewhere, we are no longer in touch, and this person is still going on with their project. They are now able to stand on their own. They can truly say they have improved their quality of life. Uh, and it, is, it, it all started with planting that one tree. Another exemplary woman that young girls should get to know also happens to come from Kenya. The country's current cabinet secretary in the Ministry of Environment, Water and Natural Resources, Judy Wakungu. She herself was the first female geologist in Kenya's Ministry of Energy and Regional Development, where her duties entailed exploring for geothermal energy in the Rift Valley. She was also the first female petroleum geologist at the National Oil Corporation of Kenya and the first female faculty member at the Department of Geology at the University of Nairobi. We got some valuable learnings from the Cabinet Secretary's personal journey as a woman in science. Well, um, when I was in school, I was more fascinated by science subjects. So I enjoyed physics, I enjoyed chemistry, I enjoyed uh, biology. Um, not so much history, <laughs> you know, or, uh, or English uh, literature. So because of that uh, affinity, I knew very well that I was going to focus uh, on a science or at least a technical area, or what we call nowadays STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I knew that's where I was going to go. But in terms of the, the field itself, you know, it evolved. You know, I was fortunate enough to go to a high school where we had excellent women teachers, and we were engaged in a lot of field work. So that, for example, during the holidays, activities would include climbing Mount Longanot, climbing Mount Kenya, go, going on field excursions to the Rift Valley, you know, understanding how the Rift Valley was formed, uh, for instance, visiting the various Rift Lakes, why some of them were freshwater lakes, why some of them were salty lakes. All of that was inculcated in us. And so that drew me towards a field that I thought combined all of the sciences very well, and this was um, geology. So when I studied geology, and this was in the, in the 80s, uh, it was then I discovered, because I was now in an all-girls school, it wasn't until I went to university that I discovered actually that now this is a male-dominated field. Because when I was in school now at St. Lawrence University in New York, not only was I the only black person uh, as an undergraduate, but I was also one of three women, you know, in the whole <laughs> uh, geology uh, department. So I adjusted, we had very good teachers and so on. I graduated, went home and uh, worked with the Ministry of Energy and Regional Development. And at that time, we were assigned to mapping out the potential areas for geothermal uh, generation. And the story continues up to my master's degree and PhD. Now, I realized then that many women were actually not drawn uh, to this particular science. It was then that it dawned on me that we needed to do something to encourage women not only to study geology, but also to study other STEM uh, uh, fields. Role models are key. Uh, for young girls growing up, when it comes to a career, they identify with a person. Not only something that they love and they have an attribute for, but they identify with role models. So this is now when we started engaging in women in science and engineering activities, going to schools, as scientists and as women engineers so that we could engage with the young girls and show them that there were options uh, for these jobs. And that's very important. At the undergraduate level, uh, in schools, we had theme houses. So those that were studying the STEM subjects 
we would put them in the same dorms so that they could engage and understand each other. Their schedules were uh, the same. We also matched them with women professors and other women in, uh, in the field. That way, as they engaged with the role models, they started gaining the confidence that they too could succeed in the fields. But we also wanted to make the environment at the workplace uh, for women uh, more welcoming, uh, because some of us had to really suffer as the guinea pigs, you know, going into this. Um, equity uh, of gender is something that we must be very careful about, but I'm pleased to say that uh, since our time, as the first ones, the environment has greatly improved for women, and we're seeing women succeeding in a variety of the STEM fields. But we don't take it for, for granted. Uh, I like to look at uh, the pipeline of women in science and engineering or in the STEM fields, starting maybe from early age. And it's a pipeline that is constantly leaking. And so all along, from showing interest in STEM fields up to developing and succeeding in a career, we have to fix the pipeline all along because it continues to, to leak. So for up to this day, I still serve as a mentor you know, for many young women uh, in this field. And I must say that we are doing very well in some fields, still slow in others, but at least you can see our representation in almost every STEM field. It appears that everybody is talking about the importance of involving girls in um, STEM uh, subjects and careers. Why? Why is it important for them to be in these fields? First of all, there are fields that present so many rewards. Um, you know, you can study electrical engineering at the undergraduate level and then go and study an MBA at the graduate level. It's very difficult to study business at the undergraduate level and then go and do a master's degree in electrical engineering. As a foundation, the STEM fields provide so many opportunities. So for example, at the undergraduate level, you can study chemistry. And then at the graduate level, you can go and study environmental science or even environmental law. I'm biased, clearly, but because of the scope and the diversity that those fields provide. And that's why I encourage many young girls to pursue the STEM fields if they have the aptitude for them. Because it, it opens up doors in terms of your careers more so than, say, the other courses, you know, such as uh, history or English literature would do. Like I said, I repeat that I am biased. But that is the trend, you know, that I have seen. It opens up so many doors and experiences for our young girls and women. You mentioned that the workplace environment has to be made more accommodating for women entering these fields. Uh, what was your experience, if you don't mind sharing? Well, I mean, of course, it's always difficult when you come into a field where traditionally they have been men. And, you know, this is a field where it was mostly field activities, uh, mapping exercises and so on. So I think part of the difficulty was the tradition, say, of the department had not been used to uh, having uh, <laughs> women in that particular area. So it's just a matter of saying, okay, when it comes to field exercises, where are we going to stay? Uh, I had an aversion to sharing a mess tent, for example. So I insisted on having, whenever I would go to fields, uh, exercises, having my own tent. And so these are just some of the measures that um, have to be taken into account when you're going to have diversity in the workplace. Um, you know, also issues such as um, how long are you going to stay uh, in the field? Will you be able to stay in the field for two months for a particular exercise? Or will that have to be shortened two weeks, you go home, you come back, etc. Uh, so it wasn't easy, but it's just a matter of changing the, the, the climate to allow diversity uh, of people, and in this case, allowing it, al allowing more flexibility or accommodating uh, women's uh, needs. You know, it also meant um, changing the culture 
uh, of some of these departments, which is not necessarily easy. So it was difficult. Yes, I don't need to get into it. I think we've come a long way uh, since then. But the only reason myself and many other women succeeded is that even in those uh, environments, we had men that were determined to fight for us. We had men that were determined that we, we succeed. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Going forward, we'll be looking to see the lessons Kenya has for us in terms of environmental policy. Up next, however, we head to the West Bank Botswana International Air Show. Welcome back to First Issues. In the few short years of its existence, the West Bank Botswana International Air Show has established the country as a leading destination for aviation enthusiasts. The event is listed among the best in the world, such as China, Russia, USA, UK, United Arab Emirates, and even France's air show that dates back over 100 years. Among the West Bank Botswana International Air Show's biggest fans is one of the world's top aerobatics pilots, having previously won the World Rally Flying Championships. Nigel Hopkins, one of the founding members of South Africa's Team Extreme, who have just performed at the invitation-only Formation Aerobatic Challenge in China, says one of his all-time favorite places to fly is here in Matsying. We ask him why that is in our conversation with him on the stunt pilot profession. It's great to be back in Botswana. The people here are very hospitable. It's a, it's a great place to fly out in the bush and uh, everybody's enthusiastic about aviation, which is uh, great for us to come and fly here. Would you uh, consider being a stunt pilot more of a passion or a profession? That's a bit of both for me, you know, obviously, uh, I do a lot of air shows around South Africa, some around the world. For me, it is a bit of a business too, but without a doubt, it's a passion. It's, uh, it's something that I just absolutely love, just improving my flying all the time and trying to do what aircraft should not do. How does one do the same? How does, do those watching at home who are interested in pursuing this path um, become a stunt pilot? I think you certainly need to have the passion and there's a lot of steps to do. So you've got to, you've got to walk the walk and, and, and jump through the hoops so to speak, you have to build up your experience. It is dangerous if you, if you try and do stuff that you haven't trained and, and you're not ready for. So there's definitely a long road to walk, but there's, there's no limits really. So if you, if you have the passion and you're committed, without a doubt. In the region, where would one initially go? What would be the first step to pursuing this? Well, obviously you'd start with a pilot's license and you'd gain the necessary experience to be able to fly solo. From there, there's an aerobatic school you can start with and then just building up your aerobatic experience, either through competition or through further training in air shows. What are the associated risks? You yourself have had a plane fall apart mid-flight uh, just in 2015. How was that experience and how would you advise those interested in the profession to, to accommodate and factor in those risks? I think like, like any sport really, uh, there, there are risks, it's how you manage those risks, the precautions you take, you know, for instance wearing a parachute and ensuring your parachute is packed safely. So like any motorsport or any sport really, you, there, there are going to be risks, make sure you, you're prepared, make sure that you've done the required training and emergency training and then you just hope a bit of luck is, is on your side too. Are you comfortable recounting that moment when, was it a wing that fell off? Yeah, it was a wing that broke and um, no, I don't mind recounting it, you know, it's one of those things that happened at the time, it was, it all happened very quickly. Um, for me really there wasn't much time to get a fright, it was just I had things to do to get out the aircraft and, and fortunately I did those at the right time. So, you know, it's uh, like I said, one of those things, I did, I did train specifically um, for a potential event like that, it's not something you hope for. 
and certainly I had a bit of luck go my way too. So. How long was it before you got back into the plane? Oh, it, was, it was pretty quick, you know. Um, obviously, I didn't have my own aircraft anymore. It took a while to get another one. So, um, yeah, that's, it's just something I needed to get back straight away, like jumping back on a horse if you fall off. So, for me, it was almost immediate. Most definitely a passion then. Without a doubt. What does Botswana stand to gain by supporting air shows and the associated professionals, aviation professionals, um, that are part of this entire spectacle? Well, what I think, benefits? You know, obviously, um, spectators at EA are seeing the air show performers, but aviation is, is such a big industry. And, you know, there's so many facets to aviation, so many job opportunities, you know, and, and whether it's on the ground or in the air or, 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 or in a service delivery um, part of aviation, it really is huge. So to bring aviation to the people through displays is really what it's about. You know, that's, we are passionate uh, about that, driving aviation and getting people involved in aviation because it is a huge industry. And I think for Botswana, definitely, they've had some great air shows and, and like I said, enthusiastic people and let's hope they get involved in aviation because it's one hell, of a, one hell of a career. And for me, uh, I don't work a day in my life. I fly airplanes and, uh, and that's the passion. In summary, all in all, what would you say have been the highest highs and the lowest lows within your career? You know, it's my, my career has spanned so many years, uh, so many thousands of hours of flying. Uh, to, to pinpoint one particular thing, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to win a world championship. I've flown to many destinations all around the world. I've had the lows of unfortunately losing some friends in aviation and, and having an incident or accident myself. So, you know, it is such a big spectrum, but um, I'm truly blessed to have been able to do what I've done. My takeaway is that aviation is passion, it is risk, it is an exhilarating and majestic human feat. But it also represents innovation, the cutting edge of science and industry. What is your takeaway? With that, however, it is a good night from me, Namazo Samakula, and the First Issues team.